going through the testosterone portion of the evening. <laughs> I don't know that that's a good thing. Um, uh, I'm going to try to keep this under seven minutes, so I'll make this quick. Um, this book is based on three stories that took place in my hometown of Vallejo, California. The unofficial city motto of which is, come for the crack, stay for the hookers. <laughs> um, the first story, of course, is the bankruptcy. And we almost had to revise our unofficial city motto with the bankruptcy, which was Vallejo, where your hopes come to die. <laughs> um, uh, the, the story there is the head of the firefighters union uh, pretty much ran the town for many years. And um, he now is the chief in Sacramento, God bless his heart, as they say in the South. And um, he almost single-handedly drove us into the, the financial ditch. We are now the first major city in California to emerge from bankruptcy, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> the second story involved a city worker. Uh, I just figured that if, if I was writing a crime story and someone killed the head, this, this guy, there would be at least 5,000 suspects, because he took the issue of breaking public service contracts into federal court. It was no longer a local issue, it was now a federal national issue. And that was a big deal to a lot of people. Um, the second story was there was a public employee on a backhoe one day, and he was working, and some kids started throwing rocks at him. And he got really annoyed, and he got off his, his machine and started confronting them, and the next thing he knew, about 20 kids were rat-packing him, and they beat him into a cone. This was caught on a camera at a local gas station. And then the third story is the most dramatic, and this is where our heroine comes from. There was a young girl named Mitzi Sanchez. We'll first start with the first girl. The first girl's name was Shana Fairchild. I remember this name about 10 years ago. She was eight years old. She was a brunette, big brown eyes. She was abducted off the streets of Vallejo, was never found again. About six weeks later, a second girl, identical description, Mitzi Sanchez, was also abducted. Three days later, she escaped. She got away from her abductor. And it was a great story. People said, wow, this plucky little heroine. And what nobody talked about was the reason she was so plucky was she was from a family of gang members. And 10 years later, she was the most notorious streetwalker at the teenage level on the city of Vallejo. And when I heard the story from the FBI agent who worked this case, I thought, and, and the cops are, of course, saying, well, she threw her life away. And I'm going, there's a story there. So I put these three things together, and that's where this comes from. The title of the book is The Wrong Girl. And uh, here we go. She had him unzipped and halfway out when the first rock hit the windshield. She called him Fireman Mike and he tested, texted her that morning, 8 a.m., wanted a hookup at 9, that quick. She considered saying no, but he'd been a freaking flyer lately and reasonably good to her. Besides, there was the money. The second rock hit while he was stuffing the bad boy back in his pants. His face had gone, what was the word Betty used? Apoleptic. This rock left a nasty hole, spiderweb fissures in the windshield. Big thing, size of a doll's head. Just sitting there on the hood now, dusted white with bits of glass. Glancing up, she spotted the source of the trouble. Five of them, hoodies and half-masked pants, hats kicked sideways, flipping off Fireman Mike, stacking hand signs, hoots, and fuck yous. The sky loomed behind them like a half-painted wall, on tinderbox gray with brush strokes of fiery white. Another rock, whistling miss. He cinched his belt. Look what they did to my goddamn windshield. So like him, my windshield. Guys with sides, everything was theirs. I'll bet you know these fucks, he said. Actually, she did. <laughs> Two, anyway. Mo Pete Carson, fat and scary, squint-eyed and dumb. Acne so bad, your own face hurt when you looked at him. <laughs> Draped in raider gear, down to the white sideline cap, favored these days by the BCK, Brickyard Cutthroat Thrillers. DeMarlo Melendez, what set was he with? Marina Black Dennis? Maybe. Could be. Could be from nowhere. Not really the banger type. D-Lo, they called him, Sulk, skulky and sad, like a kicked dog, but catches act now, off the leash, howling. The other three, Cholos, two of them, all scraggly stash and banger tap and busting his sad on their disc dickies. Benny Salgado, Brown Town Locos one of these. The other, the sweet one, was Chepe Lopez, a soldier for the NBS, and with Mr. Savages. The fifth guy was tall, coffee-colored, that's all she could see, his face buried in shadow from the hood of a sweatshirt. Misfit bunch, 
No gang ties binding them. If anything, they should have been in each other's necks. Strange, really, their being together like this. No logic to it at all. Nothing but the opportunity. Fireman in his shiny red car, getting a wake-up knob job beneath the elm trees on a drizzly school day. She told him, not so close to the corner. Christ, not so close to the school. But listen, Fireman Mike, Mighty Whitey, he runs this town. Just ask him. Their last time together, Tuesday night, city council meeting. He paid her to come, and without a stitch beneath her car coat, sit in the audience, getting juiced as he got ready to launch his parting shot at the mayor, the council, the crowd, citizen pinhead, angry Joe Blow. But it wasn't just locals in the audience. There were some guys from back east representing the National Union, firefighters, or at least they wore blues. Even packed tight into their uniforms, though, they didn't look much like firemen. They looked like muscle. Meanwhile, there she sat, wagging her shoe off the end of her foot and Jaybird naked beneath her coat, next to some old moon-faced black dude named Jeremiah in his Argyle sweater and one loafers, wanted a speed bump on his street, showed her pictures of his toothy grandkids. Shoot me now, she thought. She hadn't realized old Mike was so high up in the union till that night, or that he was the guy everybody was blaming now for the city going bankrupt. Bit of a lynch mob feeling to the room. He kind of explained what she'd seen in him lately, what she heard in his voice, a subtle kind of deflation, even defeat. He wasn't just pissed. He was bitter. He'd been hitting the Johnny Walker pretty hard the past few times they'd been together, hitting her ass pretty hard, too, and the pace had picked up five tricks in the last two weeks. When he got a shot at the lectern, the gist of the thing was this. You want somebody to blame? Look in the mirror. And when he wrapped it up, some in the crowd applauded, others catcalled or booed, and he thundered out like the banished king. Passing her seat, he nodded to her. She weighed five and tripped on after, heading out to his car. She stopped with a jolt when she saw him in the lobby with two of the asshats from the National Union. New Jersey no necks. They'd stood in a corner, Mike boxed in, all three half shouting, half whispering, one guy jabbing a finger into Mike's chest, the other guy hanging back, arms crossed, glaring. She knew better than to listen in, so she slipped out the door, headed over to the fountain on the plaza, sat down to wait. Finally, the door blew open. Fireman Mike plowed out and rushed down the concrete steps, not a glance her way, just a subtle wave of his hand. Come on. That night, he finally put up money for a real room. Time to celebrate, he said, cracking open a pipe, except it really didn't really feel much like celebration. It felt like a binge. I'm so out of here, he said, throwing back his first glass, pouring his next, not bothering with ice. I got myself a whole new situation, captain's post in Visalia, start next month. He was muttering, not to her so much as to some invisible anybody. Then he snapped back, a glance her direction, a grin that wasn't happy. More to the point, he looked scared. Maybe you can come down there sometime, Jacqueline. Got my own condo, sauna, steam room, pool. Keep me company. Think you'd like that? She sat down on the edge of the bed. And your family? His eyes went flat. Family's not coming. Family's staying put. I'll come back up on my off days. He poured her some scotch, and she pretended to drink. A hunch it might be better not to get loaded. Come on, Miss It, time to party. Spit out the old, swallow the new. The rest went fast. He threw her down on the bed so hard she bounced, ripped off the car coat, stared for a second to admire what he saw, flattering really, traced his finger around the nipple like he'd never really seen it before, looked at her eyes that way too, for a second anyway. Then he did her like a savage monkey, hard and deep and selfish, with a little help from some lube and the notorious pill. After he was done, he hit the head, soaked and sponged, even with a rubber he was paranoid, then ambled back to the bed and did the strangest thing. Rummaging through a pocket, he took out a little felt box, handed it to her, almost shy, told her to open White satin inside gold chain with a hummingbird charm. 
She knew what gifts meant. You ended up paying for them one way or the other. Still, she smiled. It was pretty. She held up her hair, and he clasped it for her, and she indulged a momentary daydream of being rescued by him somehow. But from what? Hadn't taken it off since. She reached up now, touched the tiny gold bird, felt its jagged cruelness against her skin. He threw open the car door, ass on fire, bowled toward the circle of rock tossers. Big dude, had to grant him that. Shoulders and arms like a power lifter, gripped like a slammed door. But Christ, that's what firemen did all day. Free weights and machines, strength and cardio, got paid to the nose for the privilege, too. Gotta get a piece of that, she thought. Sign up for the course of a community college. Be an EMT, maybe. Get Fireman Mike to put in a word. If she could get her grades tweaked. Yeah, sure. Right after I cure cancer. Which one of you shitbirds pitched a rock hit my windshield? Fireman Mike reached out, went to yank the hood off the Marlowe's head, but Dilo reached in and cave eye ducked away. Come on, you don't have to think about it. Who? God, he had a voice. Tough as they pretended to be, the boy shrank back a little, like the guy was a wall of heat. Mike Verrazzo, Sicilian, not Italian, he'd tell you. One more thing to swagger about, the dick. More kids came drifting through the yards, across the train tracks, up from the corner, down from campus, a dozen or more milling forward, another dozen behind them, swarming from behind the sad little houses and collecting beneath the elms and live oaks and chinaberry trees, arching over the one block street. Shuffling little homies with backpacks, pierced girls in cornrows cradling their books, black and brown in trailer trash. Responding to tweets and texts to check it out. Fireman getting blown in his car by guess who? Or just drawn by the catcalls and the flow, the laughing bodies. How, she thought, chewing away her lip gloss, am I going to get out of here? Some, something out there clicked, like a thrown switch. She saw it in Mo Pete's eyes first, glowing with hate, then Chepe's, and Benny's. Finally, the gone one she didn't recognize stepped forward and launched a haymaker from outer space. Ferrasso, she thought. He called them porch monkeys, nacho niggers, fudge nudges, something. He took the punch like a drunk's kiss, grabbed the kid's wrist, bent it back, snapped. Kung Fu fireman, like that could save him. The gaunt kid howled, buckling, and the other four just stared. Then another switch flipped. The four newfound road dogs snapped too, rallied, jumped on fireman Mike, circling fast, a blur of kicks, fists, wham to the lower back, thwack to the knees, pow to the back of the head. Verrazzo gave back as good as he got, for a while anyway, then one savage punch from Benny Salgado up under the rib cage, boom, like that. Fireman Mike was keeling sideways and hollow knee. It left him open, and sad dog DeMarlo wound up for a free kick to the jellies. Bunkered inside the car, safe behind the windshield glass, even she winced at the impact. Ferrazzo closed up like a knife, dropped to the asphalt. Dilo jigged and pranced, arms high. Score! The onlooker, the onlooker circled in tight now, screaming, egging the firefighters on. Light him up! Make him pay! Fucking good! Boys mostly, but a few girls too. Other girls stood in tight little knots, rolling their eyes, playing too good for all this, like it was some clip they were catching on YouTube, not a rat-packed man right there. I should honk the horn, she thought. Something. They're going to kill him. Which brought to mind his wallet. She turned to his jacket, hung over the seat, rifled the pockets, found the thing. Too late to unfuck the situation, she thought, scooping out the cash. Could be my last payday from Farmer Mike for Christ who knows. Counting, she found a mere 34 bucks, barely enough to pay her. What was up with that? Just then, a lonely guy drifted past the car. Hoodie like the others, but wrong style jeans and worn too high. Work boots, not kicks. How old? She couldn't tell. A slouch in his walk, ambling quick to where Verazzo lay curled up on the ground. The loner dropped to one knee, untucked his hands from the sweatshirt pouch, and let loose with three crushing blows, pitching his torso and shoulder into it, hands swinging like they had a hammer, pounding a spike into Verazzo's neck. The crowd went nuts, hoots and cackles and cheers. Run, she told herself. 
too stupid from shock to move. The stranger got back to his feet, tottering a little. His whole body shuddered like a current running through him and shorted out. Mo Pete stood there, staring like a hole that opened up in the street, ready to swallow them all. He pushed past Chepe and ran. It rippled through the crowd then, like a pulse, mutters and curses, finally screams, bodies scattered, pinwheeling every which way, down the tunnel of oaks and elms and chinaberry trees, back between the shabby houses, pushing through gaps and fences or scrambling over, making for the railroad tracks and beyond, hood rats and cholos and hangers on, even girls in heels. Some still were laughing. Get out of the goddamn car, she told herself, reaching for the handle, yanking, nothing. The door was locked. She grabbed a plunger, flipped it up. The guy pivoted, stuffed his hands back in his sweatshirt pouch, and lurched back the way he'd come. Through the spiderweb cracks in the windshield, their eyes locked. For a second, she recognized the emptiness, the savage, lonely, punk nada, like staring at a picture of yourself until the edges blur, the edges of everything. <laughs> and the feeling of being somewhere high up at night, nothing left to do but fall. Then her own switch clicked. The cruel gold hummingbird quivered at her breastbone. She was shaking, but she got out, stood up, shouted, what the fuck you do? Her voice sounding strange and small and far off, the cry of some treetop bird. Answer me, asshole, what the fuck did you do? The guy glanced once her direction. A face she half recognized, maybe, not quite sure, long and bag eyed and older than the rest of him, bony and thin lipped. And for a second, he hesitated, and she thought to herself, Yeah, come on, finish it. But instead, he just shuddered again, some invisible hand grabbing him by the neck, and he tucked himself down and kept moving. It was raining now, a wind driven mist that metal smell. Jackie ran, knelt down in the damp street, and pushed her hair back, turned Verazzo toward, toward her slow. Remembering how he'd looked at her in the motel room, she needed to see his eyes. They hovered in their sockets like sick fish, shiny but gray and still. His skin had turned waxy, and a curdle of blood flecked his teeth. A deep florid bruise on his throat, like some awful birthmark. Home. His voice a busted hiss, eyes scary red and huge. She started digging through pockets like she had for his wallet, wondering for a moment if, since she was hanging in there with him, he wouldn't mind the money she'd lifted. You're strong, she said, strongest fucker I know. Hang tough, asshole, come on. She found the phone, thumbed in 911. Dispatch came on, a woman. Somebody here got jumped bad. Golden Rock, the cul-de-sac up from the Pango, on, on, on the telltale beep in a blizzard of static. Nasal drawl. What's your name, please? He's Mike Ferrazzo, fireman. You know what, who I mean. He's hurt bad. I need your name, miss. Jackie thumbed off, dropping the phone like she'd been scalded. It clattered against the damp pavement. He'll be here soon. She took his hand, the palm thick with calluses, icy, damp. Can't stick around, Mike. His grip clenched, not hard, a tip. She finger combed the hair from his face, noticing more than before the gray leaching in at the temples, even the rough gunmetal undercoat in his stubble. She brushed a few droplets of rain from his brow, and at just that moment he launched into a seizure, locking up, trembling so hard he inched across the blacktop like death was shaking him out of a deep sleep. The sleep called his life and dragging him away. Thanks.